Okay, uh, hello everyone. It's great uh, to be here, uh, even though online with all of you. And thank you so much for every, uh, for every participant that has joined us in what is going to hopefully be a wonderful um, conversation. Uh, you're here for the liberal versus democratic conception of free speech. We have two distinguished and uh, eminent speakers. Uh, first, we'll hear from Professor Matthew Kramer, who is Professor of Legal and Political uh, Philosophy at Cambridge University and a Fellow of Churchill College at the same university. He is the Director of the Cambridge Forum for Legal and Political Philosophy. He has authored uh, several books, uh, 18 books, and he's the co-editor of four additional books. Uh, he is written on almost everything under the sun in uh, in this in the in the field of legal uh, moral and uh, political philosophy um, and his most recently published book uh, well his penultimate book I should say um, is on the topic of today is freedom of expression of a self restraint published by Oxford University Press uh, just last year um, and I, I take it that you will be speaking uh, mostly in defense of a liberal conception of freedom of expression. But of course, Professor Kramer uh, will, uh, will speak about, uh, will, will, will talk about that in more detail. So on the other side, uh, speaking mostly from a uh, democratic position on freedom of expression, we have Professor Eric Heinze who uh, I'm delighted to say is my colleague here at uh, Queen Mary University of London um, and he's a professor of law uh, and humanities here. Uh, his uh, most recently published book is on the topic of today's conversation and is entitled The Most Human Right, Why Free Speech is Everything. And this has been published by MIT Press uh, just earlier this year. So, hot off uh, the press. Uh, he is also the author of Hate Speech and Democratic Citizenship, which was published in 2016, and several other books. Uh, he is also a very prolific uh, writer. Okay, so the, the format for today <clears throat> will be as follows. Uh, I will ask Professor Kramer to speak for about 20 minutes. After, after him, Professor Heinzer will speak for another 20 minutes. And then I will uh, uh, chair the uh, Q&A, the questions and answers session. Uh, the, the latter session, the question and answer session, uh, will not be recorded. But uh, for your information, the, um, the, the talk uh, by both professors are being recorded. Uh, so last service announcement, uh, we will feel free to go past the hour. So we are more likely to finish towards 6 p.m. than 5.30, but of course, you are uh, welcome to join or leave us at any point uh, that most suits you. Okay, without further ado, I will now uh, stop speaking and leave the floor to Professor Kramer. Uh, uh, Professor Kramer, you have about 20 minutes. Thank you very much, John. I want to begin by thanking you as the person who got the ball, ball rolling on this matter, putting this event together. Likewise, thanks to uh, Penny and Gulsh for their uh, central roles in organizing the event. And then, of course, to Eric for taking on the uh, role of a disputant in this event. I, I say disputant, but it, it's not really a dispute or a debate exactly, just an exchange of views, because I'm a proponent of liberal democracy, so it's not that I'm opposed to the democratic case, but I, I think the uh, strongest case for the principle of freedom of expression is indeed, as John characterized it, a, a liberal case, and so that's what I'll uh, that's what I'll be putting forward here. Uh, I obviously I have to compress a 350-page book into 20 minutes, so I'm obviously going to have to omit uh, virtually every aspect of what I argue in in uh, the book that I published last year. But I, I will uh, seek to touch upon a few crucial points. 
So the first thing to do is to articulate the, the moral principle of freedom of expression as I understand that principle. And it, uh, it would be along the following lines that a necessary condition for the moral permissibility of any law or action by a system of governance that prohibits or prevents any type or instance of communicative activity is that the communicative activity in question is constitutive of communication independent misconduct. And that's a bit of a, a mouthful. Uh, it obviously needs to be elucidated a bit. And in particular, I need to explain what I mean by communication independent misconduct. And then I'll go on to explain why I think that's crucial to uh, the, the very nature of the principle of freedom of expression. So by communication independent misconduct, I mean some uh, mode of communicative activity that is aptly classifiable as a type of wrongdoing that can be perpetrated either communicatively or non-communicatively. So when I talk about communication independence, what, what I mean is that communication independent wrongdoing is such that it can be perpetrated through uh, activity that is communicative or through activity that is not communicative. And therefore, it's communication independent in precisely that sense. So let me offer a couple of examples just to clarify what communication independence is in the sense um, that, that I'm specifying. Uh, so suppose, let's take the uh, famous example, an example put forward just over a hundred years ago by uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the renowned American jurist who in a, a, a one of his most famous opinions, uh, though it was uh, an early, relatively early judgment when he was on the wrong side, on the side of repressing freedom of expression, um, he put forward the example of a man who uh, in a dark theater uh, shouts fire deliberately in order to provoke a dangerous public disturbance. And this was put forward, obviously, as, a, as an example of a type of communicative conduct that can legitimately be proscribed. And obviously, I agree with Holmes that that type of communicative activity <clears throat> can legitimately be proscribed. Um, and the question is why? Well, the, the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is that the conduct in question is a communication or, or is constitutive of communication independent wrongdoing. That is, it constitutes an effort to provoke a dangerous public disturbance. And such an effort can be communicative as it is obviously in the example of someone shouting fire, but it also can be non-communicative. It could be uh, it, it could be undertaken, for example, through shooting a gun or starting a fire, for that matter, or spraying a hose over people, or whatever the uh, nature of the endeavor might be. It could be uh, communicative, and indeed very plausibly is, as it, as it was in the example Holmes offered, or it could be non-communicative. And therefore, the type of wrongdoing that is endeavoring to provoke a dangerous public disorder, uh, a, a situation of dangerous public disorder. That type of wrongdoing is communication independent. And the fact that it's undertaken communicatively in a certain instance doesn't uh, exempt it from being legally proscribed and legally uh, subject to legal sanctions. So that's one example of what I have in mind when I talk about communication independent misconduct. Another example, John Stuart Mill's example in On Liberty, uh, but again, it could uh, be paralleled by any number of actual examples, um, is that of a uh, firebrand orator who um, incites an angry mob outside the home of a corn dealer. Uh, the orator incites the mob to lynch the corn dealer by 
inveighing against the iniquity and exploitativeness of corn dealers in a situation where the mob are already enraged about increases in the price of corn and so forth. So this, uh, again, is an example of a type of communicative activity um, that can legitimately be proscribed. And again, the question is, why is it subject to legitimate proscription? The answer is that it, again, is constitutive of communication independent wrongdoing. That is, it's uh, the, uh, the oration delivered, this act of incitement, um, is correctly classifiable as the opening stage in the perpetration of a lynching. It's the manner in which the orator participates in this terrible wrong. And so it constitutes his participation in a communication independent type of wrongdoing. One way of participating is to, is to stir the mob into such a rage that it, will, uh, that it will indeed proceed with lynching the corn dealer. Another way of participating would be placing a rope around the neck of the corn dealer each of those is a way of participating in this heinous action, but um, the fact that one of them is communicative and the other is non-communicative is neither here nor there as far as explaining why each type of action can legitimately be proscribed. In each case, the action can legitimately be proscribed because it is a uh, prohibitable communication type, a communication independent type of wrongdoing. So that's another example of what I have in mind when I talk about a communicative activity that is constitutive of communication independent wrongdoing. And the principle of freedom of expression, as I understand it, as I articulated it at the outset, maintains an effect that no type of, uh, no type or instance of communicative activity can ever legitimately be proscribed unless it is constitutive of communication independent wrongdoing. And uh, I now come, since this, is, the, since this event is focused mainly on justifications for the principle of freedom of expression, I now come to the question, well, why is, is the principle of freedom of expression along those lines? Why is the key point of differentiation between communicative uh, activities that are not constitutive of communication independent wrongdoing, where their wrongness, if they are indeed wrong, is distinctively communicative rather than uh, communication independent <clears throat> versus communicative activities that do constitute communication independent wrongdoing. Why is that the key distinction? And this brings me to the, the chapter four of my 2021 book, Freedom of Expression as Self-Restraint, provides the justification, which I'm going to squeeze into a few minutes here. So the uh, notion would be that when a system of governance proscribes communicative activities that are not constitutive of communication independent wrongdoing, its actions and laws uh, that are marshaled uh, in, su in uh, support or pursuit of such an endeavor are both overweening and degrading for that system of governance. That is, they're overweening in the sense that they extend the uh, interdictory or pro uh, proscriptive power of the government to matters that should be um, beyond the uh, proscriptive reach of the system. And it's degrade, uh, that sort of overweeningness is also degrading because it presupposes the failure of a system of governance um, to bring about a situation in which uh, these prohibitory measures, laws or other measures, um, would be wholly unnecessary and, 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 in, and indeed uh, humiliating. So um, I'm, I, I'm going to elaborate on what I've just said, partly by reading a bit from a page in my book. But before I come to that, let me just say a little bit 
about this dynamic of overweeningness um, and and or grandiosity and degradingness or demeaningness. Um, that dynamic is uh, something which I find in in ancient Stoicism, Hellenistic Stoicism specifically, where the notion is that the ethical uh, health, the ethical strength of an individual or a society or a system of governance is marked by the extent to which it can um, safely and confidently um, put up with uh, occurrences or um, happenings that um, affect it adversely, or at least that would um, uh, seem to be adverse. Uh, in, in their implications. And um, I have something of that sort in mind, that is that a system of governance which fulfills its moral responsibilities will have brought about a state of affairs in which the notion of proscribing communicative activities that are not constitutive of communication independent misconduct um, would be risible and, in, and indeed uh, uh, to clearly worthy of disdain in the sense that any effort to prescribe such activities in those circumstances would be regarded as indicative of weakness and, and regarded as, um, as degrading for the system of governance that attends to it. In the way that to take an image from uh, Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, the notion that a mighty eagle uh, attends not to the uh, chirping of little birds um, because the e eagle is confident that with a single swipe of its wing, it could wipe out all those birds if it chose to. And therefore it doesn't have to concern itself with, the, with their chirping. Um, and that uh, image I think captures well this way in which um, the a, a suitable level of ethical strength is tied up with uh, an ethic of self-restraint. Um, so I'm going to read a, a bit from a page in my book because uh, it may occur to some or all of you that um, one area of communicative activity that has been particularly in contention when um, both proponents of the principle of freedom of expression speak on these matters and their opponents um, is, the, is uh, an area on which both Eric and I have written extensively, and that is hate speech, because um, hate speech in certainly in, in some sense is not harmful, uh, excuse me, harmless. It's not harmless, um, but the question is the type of harm or the way in which it is harmful. Is it uh, such that the hate speech in question is constitutive of communication independent misconduct or not? Well, on the one hand, hate speech certainly can be constitutive of communication independent misconduct. And in chapter six of my book, which is focused entirely on hate speech, I adduce uh, uh, a number of uh, categories of co uh, communication independent wrongdoing that occurs through hate speech. So there can be and certainly are instances of hate speech that do constitute communication independent misconduct. And therefore the principle of freedom of expression is entirely consistent with the prohibition of those types of hate speech. But there are uh, countless other instances of hate speech that do not constitute uh, communication independent misconduct, however ugly they may be. Their ugliness is distinctively communicative rather than communication independent. And so I therefore argue sustainably in chapter six of my 2021 book against the legitimate prohibitability of instances of hate speech that are not constitutive of communication independent wrongdoing. And 
So in the chapter that provides my justification for the principle of freedom of expression, I'm pondering an example of someone, I, I name this person Ken, but that doesn't matter, um, who uh, is indeed uttering hateful sentiments, but is doing so in a way that is not like Mill's orator who, who uh, perpetrates incitement, which can legitimately be proscribed as a communication independent type of misconduct. Rather, it, it's simply to use the US Supreme Court's distinction, it's advocacy of hateful ideas rather than incitement to violence. And so I'm pondering this example where uh, Ken, Ken's hideous utterances are not constitutive of communication independent misconduct and why uh, the prohibition of such utterances would be both overweening uh, and degrading for any system of governance that undertakes such prohibitions. So here is a bit, this is only again, uh, an excerpt given constraints of time, um, but he, here is a little bit from what I write about that example. As is manifest then, the subjection of Ken, this uh, utterer of hateful sentiments, to legal sanctions for his oration or distribution would be at variance with the principle of freedom of expression that has been expounded in this book. Any such subjection of him to sanctions would be morally impermissible, not because the countering of his propagation of hatefulness is no business of any system of governance, but instead, precisely because every such system is morally obligated to undertake numerous measures to counteract the ranting of bigots and to counteract the, the noxious effects of the marketing of pornography, many of the techniques that can and should be employed for that purpose by any system of governance will be recounted in the following two chapters, chapters five and six, where I uh, uh, um, go into such techniques at length. Some of those techniques are anticipatory, where it, that is, they occur before the hateful utterances uh, arise, whereas others are responsive to what has already occurred. Some are wide ranging, whereas others are more narrowly focused. Diverse though these sundry techniques are, however, they are alike in that they neither prohibit nor prevent any communicative activities that are not constitutive of communication independent misconduct. Any system of governance is morally obligated to make use of a large number of those, of those non-prohibitory and non-preventative methods. In so doing, it will not only be striving to fulfill its responsibility to foster a robust ethos of liberal democracy in its society. In addition, it will be acting in furtherance of the ideal of freedom of expression. That ideal is furthered by those methods, partly because they are fully consistent with the principle of freedom of expression, but also, and even more, because they obviate the need for any governmentally imposed restrictions which are inconsistent with that principle. So that's the idea. The, uh, there's a, a clear insistence on toleration of um, communicative activities that are not constitutive of communication independent misconduct. But the toleration in question isn't feckless acquiescence. The toleration in question is accompanied by an array of measures to counter the effects of hateful utterances and other, other malign forms of uh, communication, such as uh, hardcore pornography and the like. And uh, the, a system of governance that fulfills its moral responsibilities by um, carrying out these various measures will thereby have promoted a robust ethos of liberal democracy that will render wholly unnecessary the prohibition of hateful utterances that are not constitutive of communication independent misconduct because the effect of such utterances will be to bring contempt upon those who engage in them rather than to bring contempt upon the targets of the utterances. 
So there's a lot more to be said on this matter. Naturally, I've taken 350 pages in my book here. I've taken about 20 minutes. But since I have now used up my time, I will stop at that point. Thank you so much, Matthew, for being a, um, a paradigm of keeping to time. This is uh, wonderful. And thank you for doing that. And I'll invite Professor Heinze to uh, also be a paradigm of good timekeeping. And uh, I, uh, we look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you very much. Okay, well, th uh, thank you, John. And of course, thank you very, very much, Matthew, for, uh, uh, for an act that I'm sure will be hard for me to follow. Um, nevertheless, um, before jumping headlong into the concept of a democratic approach, uh, I'd like to maybe just say a few words about why this distinction between a liberal foundation and a democratic foundation even matters, uh, because I suspect it might strike some people as, as rather academic uh, and maybe even arid or unduly abstract. Um, in fact, I suspect that if you were to place, I don't know, a hundred different scenarios uh, before Matthew and before me, it might be that we agree on 98 of them uh, and with very little disagreement, and perhaps we would agree on all of them, uh, and so then the question is, real, does it really matter uh, what the minutiae of our particular models might be? And I think it does matter. Um, of course, one test of a theory of a model is its internal coherence, right? Does it, does it rest upon premises, upon principles, upon values that do not contradict each other, that cohere? into a logical system. But of course, another test of a model is its completeness, right? In other words, does it answer all of the questions that people think need to be answered? Um, and so I guess my problem with liberal approaches, and incidentally, not just to free speech, um, in many areas, uh, I, I prefer what I'm going to try to describe as a democratic model, not because I think the liberal models are wrong, uh, um, but, but, but rather that I think that they tell us too little, that you might say that they're insufficiently determined. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering if uh, a democratic model can answer a few more of the questions that we care about when we're talking about things like free speech, and in particular, to use the example that uh, Matthew just cited, a problem of hate speech, which has very much become a litmus test about our ideas on free speech. Um, but again, just to just to try to understand um, what might what what I feel might be insufficient in the idea of a liberal model or a liberal approach. Um, so, so then what exactly do we mean more generally by liberal? Of course, it's a term that causes endless confusion because uh, you know for. We, quite a long time now in the English speaking world, uh, the word liberal in popular usage, you know, in the media and so forth, tends to mean socially progressive. Now, of course, uh, uh, this is rather different from, from its earlier meanings, uh, what we tend to refer to as classical liberalism. Um, classical liberalism is associated with all sorts of uh, well-known thinkers, uh, many of whom contradict each other in a number of ways. John Locke, Immanuel Kant, John Stuart Mill, John Rawls, we could name dozens of others who all in some way have been described as uh, forming part of the classical liberal tradition, and yet in fundamental uh, points, they often disagree with each other. Uh, so what does it even mean to talk about a liberal model? Um, and I'm simply going to use as my point of departure that um, what largely unites, I'm, I'm not going to promise that I'm bringing in every conceivable thinker here, but what largely unites what we could call a classical liberal tradition is the idea that the individual remains the focus 
of ethics and politics that, for example, um, majoritarian decision making or utilitarian decision making um, uh, cannot extend so far as to simply obliterate the interests even of a single individual. Um, uh, another way to put this is that for the classical liberal tradition, it's not the traditional kinship group or clan group or family group or household group or religious group that would form the locus of uh, ethical and political interest, but indeed the individual. Um, uh, again, uh, I, I don't mean in this description to have said everything there is to be said about classical liberalism. It's only a point of departure. Um, and then just one other little conceptual point uh, uh, before I try to make a bit of headway. Uh, I think Matthew explained very well that uh, it's very hard ever to generalize about speech as if it all comes in a bundle. There are so many different kinds of speech that it's almost inconceivable that we can speak about speech um, uh, uh, with any degree of regulatory detail as a whole, right? We, we look very differently on things like commercial advertising or professional defamation or hate speech or uh, graffiti or betrayal of national security secrets and so on and so on. And so uh, there's always a problem about speaking about speech as if it were a, uh, a, a, a single object. So I would like to draw one fundamental distinction. Uh, and the distinction I would wish to draw would be between targeted speech, and in particular, something like targeted hate speech and public discourse. When I talk about targeted speech, I mean something that might be provocative or hateful uh, 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 um, or uh, uh, offensive. Um, which is aimed at identifiable individuals. So for example, if I directly uh, voice racist or sexist or homophobic or other such invective um, at an individual on the street, an individual uh, who, whom one could identify, um, uh, this would be a kind of targeted speech in a situation of harassment or stalking or some such thing. Um, now, I'm going to distinguish that kind of targeted offense from general public discourse, in other words, general statements that are made to general audiences. As to targeted speech, in fact, if you look at jurisdictions throughout the world, even jurisdictions that are highly protective of speech, such as the American uh, legal system, even that system does not actually protect uh, targeted, uh, 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 most targeted offense of the kind I've just described. And so, um, and I find also among writers in this area, uh, it's actually very, very few who would extend legal protection even to this kind of immediately uh, uh, directed, immediately targeted speech, um, uh, 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 which is again of a kind of offensive or provocative character. So I'm simply going to leave that aside. In my view, uh, certainly from my reading, the real debates about free speech are about general statements made to general audiences. In other words, what is commonly known as public discourse. Um, if I do not target any identical individual as such, but if I simply target a whole group, if I slur a whole group, again, it could be a racial group, an ethnic group, a religious group, uh, a sexual minority, or what have you, um, uh, uh, should I have that freedom um, uh, uh, if, my, uh, uh, if, um, uh, if my speech is uh, excessively provocative, excessively offensive, uh, even if, again, I'm not uh, targeting any particular individuals or any identifiable people. Uh, again, I think that's where the real debates lie. Now, um, again, I think a problem 
with the with the kind of classical liberal approaches is that uh, for all of their differences, again, insofar as liberalism takes uh, 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 the individual individual interests as their point of departure for ethical or political or indeed uh, legal norms, um, uh, liberalism's overriding aim is to protect the greatest possible individual liberty for all citizens. Now, I'm countering this with a democratic approach, which I would argue is not aimed at optimizing individual liberty as such, but rather at optimizing or in any event, protecting individuals' greatest possible opportunities for civic participation for participation in the body politic, to speak up, to speak out, to dissent, uh, to argue, and so forth. Um, this is something that, that the classical liberal tradition is entirely agnostic about. Uh, uh, it, it simply uh, it aims to uh, protect a particular sphere of individual liberty. What you choose to do with that liberty is, is, is entirely up to you. Indeed, uh, uh, there are many, there are, there are certainly a long tradition of liberal thinking, which uh, does not require democracy at all. Many people have read Thomas Hobbes uh, as a liberal. In fact, a number of very in uh, influential interpreters have done this, even though Hobbes advocated, uh, of course, um, uh, well, what we could call despotic government, uh, or at any rate, uh, absolutist government. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, the classical liberal tradition, again, for the most part, simply regulates how much freedom the individual has and uh, has no necessary interest in our opportunities to participate. Uh, in uh, uh, in democratic processes, um, why is that a problem? Uh, again, if the focus is on optimizing our liberty, not only in the sphere of speech, but generally speaking, as autonomous agents, then to name another example, this would also include economic liberty, and it usually does on most classical liberal theories. Uh, economic liberty therefore enables the possibility of great gaps of wealth. Great gaps of wealth entail great gaps of power. And great gaps of power pose the risk that citizens will not be sufficiently equally situated to be able to participate in democracy. Um, this is a problem that uh, uh, in one way or another, I think is the principal objection to, uh, to regimes of free speech. Um, when we listen to people today who have concerns about things like hate speech, again, on grounds of, uh, of, uh, of racism or sexism or homophobia or, or, or whatever other category, the, ultimately the concern is that certain groups uh, will in a sense be publicly bullied um, uh, into, uh, 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 into positions that constantly entrench historically inferior positions in a democracy, uh, that many of these groups uh, already come to us, come into the present through long histories of subordination, sometimes even violent oppression, that the effects have um, uh, 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 an, historically, an historically continuous character. Um, uh, again, these are very complex phenomena. I don't necessarily want uh, today to take any final view on, on the character of these histories. All I'm saying is that we can't ignore these objections. We, we have to take them seriously. And I have doubts about whether classical liberal approaches do this sufficiently. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, and I believe that what we need to do is see how a, a model more focused on democracy can better address these concerns. Um, and in fact, when we look, when we see the focus, when we see that the problem of inequality is indeed central and an ongoing, and it's a long-standing problem for theories of democracy. Well, what we see are essentially two conflicting models of democracy, two opposing models of democracy. So one model of democracy um, would say that 
we should all have the greatest possible freedom of speech because that would allow the greatest possible democratic and civic participation. The other one is, as I've just described, the other one says, no, sometimes we need to limit certain forms of dangerous or aggressive or antagonistic speech in order to ensure that people who have historically been disadvantaged, subordinated, even silenced, can also mobilize effectively, speak effectively, and, uh, 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 and gain some hope uh, of an audience that would be necessary in order to agitate for law reform or uh, for uh, whatever they think uh, are the ends that democracy exists to serve. So then how do we resolve this conflict between two different understandings of democracy? Well, um, uh, um, in, in, in my own writing, what I've argued is that it's not enough simply for us to optimize individual freedom in the area of free speech. Um, at the same time, what is, what is compulsory, what is absolutely necessary is that democratic government itself, although it should not be punitive, it must be proactive. That government that 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 only in a democracy in which from the youngest age certain civic values, values of inclusion, of pluralism are actively inculcated, only then can we say that a, a, a society is sufficiently set up to ensure that um, freedom of expression does not spill over into a constant and endless entrenchment of, uh, 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 of power structures that end up uh, 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 eliminating certain voices from the democratic sphere. Um, um, uh, and for the simple reason that if enough people are excluded for long enough, um, uh, ultimately the democracy itself starts to uh, uh, have serious question marks hanging over it. People stop believing it, people disengage from it. This is not desirable in a democracy. In a democracy, it's important that as many people as possible feel that they're part of it. Um, now, I just want to be clear about, uh, you know, since, since I've mentioned the, 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 the crucial role of, uh, of certain kind of oppressive and, and bleak histories, um, I don't want to suggest that free speech has always necessarily been an oppressive force. Far from it. If I believed this, I would take precisely the other view. I would, I would not be a free speech activist at all. Um, I think uh, 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 very often free speech has actually been an essential element for uh, suppressed minorities to be able to acquire a democratic voice and to agitate effectively for law reform. Um, uh, I think we could find many examples of this. Um, uh, so I don't mean to say that uh, uh, free speech necessarily uh, 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 entails power dynamics that become destructive of the very fabric of democracy and the very structures and procedures of democracy itself. I don't mean to say this. I'm simply saying that, uh, again, a liberal model which solely emphasizes the optimization of freedom without taking these possible risks of democracy to, uh, to democracy into account uh, is simply underdetermined. It's 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 okay as far as it goes. It just doesn't go far enough. Um, I would also. <laughs> Like Matthew, uh, like Matthew, I'm also trying to suppress many pages into 20 minutes. Um, uh, and so um, I, I, there, there are quite a few points I would wish to add. Um, but uh, I can see that my time is also coming to an end. And quite frankly, I'd be very interested now to, to jump quickly into our uh, discussion session because I'd love to hear what some of the uh, people who have been listening uh, have to say. Um, so I'll simply conclude on one note, which is that another reason why this little discussion between Matthew and me might sound uh, 
uh, you know, almost precious um, is that the world seems to be going in precisely the opposite direction from either Matthew or me. The world is not becoming, uh, certainly not becoming more de democratic and certainly not becoming more liberal in the sense that Matthew understands. Rather, we're, we're marching headlong into autocracy on all four continents. Um, and I imagine for many, um, uh, uh, for, for many people who are listening to us today, this might be a more central concern. Indeed, this was the reason I wrote my last book, uh, uh, Why Free Speech is Everything, trying to situate free speech with respect to human rights. Uh, and so I simply want to want to say that uh, I don't think Matthew or I are under any kind of illusion that we're talking about the whole world here. Uh, obviously, we are assuming societies that are lucky enough to uh, have a certain liberal and democratic structure. Um, um, uh, uh, the rise of autocracy is worrisome indeed, but nevertheless, I think why it's important for, 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 for people like Matthew and me to continue this discussion is precisely as our small contribution to resisting autocracy and to trying to strengthen the models that we have and to understand where they lead us. Okay, now I see my 20 minutes are truly exhausted, so I will be quiet. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you to Matthew. Thank you to John, to Penny and to all of you in the audience. Uh, well, thank you to you, Eric, uh, and to Matt, of course, for <clears throat> uh, for your for keeping to time and also for the substance of your of your view. Um, uh, while I remind the audience to uh, please, if you if you would like to contribute can you please uh, either raise your hand if you're happy to speak <clears throat> uh, via audio or you can also put uh, your questions or comments in the chat and and I will moderate and, and, and give you give you the floor as uh, as, as time permits um, so while while the audience uh, is uh, prepares itself uh, to, to do that perhaps I can ask Matt <clears throat> to uh, and, and, and Eric, of course, perhaps to first if they want to respond to one of the things, one, a couple of things that the other has said, and secondly, pa um, to, to reflect on what are the possible dangers. So you have said a lot in defense of freedom of, of expression, yes, but I, I, I wonder whether there are any downsides to uh, your your own defenses of freedom of expression or to freedom of expression in, in general. So okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll say a few words. First of all, the uh, version of liberalism that uh, Eric was impugning in his presentation is not my version. And, and I actually agree with pretty much everything he said uh, in, in doubting the um, sufficiency of, of that version of liberalism. Um, because I certainly don't take a consequentialist approach that would endeavor to optimize liberty, as he as he put it. Um, and likewise, uh, a key feature of my justification for the principle of freedom of expression is the notion that uh, what warrants a healthy level of self-respect on the part of each citizen is in part a function of the uh, character of the system of governance that presides over the society in which each citizen lives. And it's uh, the degradingness and overweeningness of measures of, um, that are in contravention of the principle of freedom of expression that detract from the character of a system of governance and which therefore uh, lower the extent to which it can play this role in solidifying or bolstering the levels of self-respect that people are warranted in feeling. So I don't regard that as at all a focus on isolated individuals in any way, quite the contrary. It emphasizes the ways in which the uh, fortunes of individuals are connected with the, uh, the, the character or uh, ethical solidity of their system of governance. Very quickly in response to what John asked as far as dangers. Well, I think both Eric and I are very sensitive to the dangers that are engendered by um, freedom of expression. And that's precisely why I do place so much emphasis on the uh, diverse measures that a system of governance is morally obligated 
to undertake to counteract those dangers. Um, but my point is precisely that if those measures are undertaken sufficiently and suitably, then they will render unnecessary, they will obviate, obviate the need for um, prohibiting communicative activities that are not constitutive of communication independent misconduct. Thank you, Eric. Uh, can you take the floor? But before you do, I see that Mayara and, and Matt um, Matravers have, have, have raised their hand and I would <coughs> invite uh, the rest of the audience to uh, also indicate whether they want to participate by raising their hands or by writing in the chat. And after Eric has, has, has replied, uh, I will stop recording. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, right, well, John, you're certainly right, always to ask about downsides of anything that sounds too rosy and optimistic, <laughs> uh, because it's, it's usually behind the rosiness that all the downsides are hiding. And obviously, I think we say all we have to do is go into our Twitter accounts today and see all the downsides, right? They're not hard to find, uh, uh, and I don't mean to make light of it. Obviously, um, the, the electronic revolution has unleashed a power of speech that uh, that was, you know, when we were children was still unthinkable. Um, uh, and in particular, you know, what's interesting, in, before the internet age, um, uh, it was very unclear uh, whether whether we could even say that speech acts within the public sphere, what I've been calling public discourse, general statements to general audiences, um, it was unclear whether there was really ever any kind of demonstrable causation to to, to, to you know to 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 material harms. Uh, in fact, virtually essentially no studies ever showed any. And this was always a real problem for people who were doubting uh, or challenging free speech uh, uh, values. Uh, I think now in the internet age, it's much harder to doubt that kind of causation. Uh, there, I think there are now too many examples where, uh, 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 where at, at least some forms of, uh, of uh, incendiary speech have indeed uh, translated into violent and often lethal action. This is certainly a downside. Um, at the same time, what social media teaches us, and uh, this I find uh, increasingly accepted by experts in the field. In fact, I just came back from a, from a week-long conference on this point, um, is that uh, punishments, criminal penalties of the traditional kind upon speech acts, and certainly within the sphere of electronic communication, are essentially futile, highly random, highly arbitrary. Uh, for any given act that you punish, there will be a thousand others that are just like it or worse that are going unpunished, right? Um, and so it seems to me that the consensus uh, in this field is, is moving increasingly toward um, non-punitive, but what I'm, in other words, what I'm calling non-punitive, but proactive. Right, and again, this was something that you know that I had already advocated in my in my first book that you mentioned in uh, in 2016, "Hate Speech and Democratic Citizenship," where uh, you know where I uh, uh, oh, again just to repeat what I said during my presentation, uh, I I refuse to uh, to um, to separate individual freedom from the responsibility of states to inculcate values of democratic citizenship, which are values of pluralism, uh, uh, um, uh, values of inclusion, which have to be inculcated from the youngest age. Uh, I think here, um, Germany, for example, gives us a fine example. Um, Germany punishes forms of hate speech that would not be punished, uh, say, in the United States. Uh, but I think uh, if you really study a lot of the German literature, a lot of the German evidence, you see that the penalties have at best been useless and at worst actually fanned the flames of hate groups. I think the evidence for this is overwhelming. What has worked in Germany is public education. 
the fact that right and particularly holocaust education but then all but also increasingly education on racism on colonialism this starts in germany at very young ages they do visits to concentration camps these sorts of things or you know or, or interviews and such like it's also very present in the german media has been for decades um uh, i just think there's no doubt that it's that kind of proactive but non-punitive approach which overwhelmingly has worked and which i think um more society more democracies need to consider again as to autocratic regimes which are you know increasing as we speak um well they're all bets are always off autocratic regimes will simply always control speech in the interests of the regime you, you can't really talk about free speech at all okay thank you so much eric um uh there are a few questions and a few people have raised their hands so in order to enable uh free uh free speech within this group uh, i shall stop uh the recording now and then i will invite uh Mar yara porto matt matravers and uh there is also a question in the in the chat by uh by Elvira. Okay, I'll stop recording now.